Hi, my name is Nalani Brown. I'm the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones, and I'm going to be picking up where Shelly Harris left off in Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown. It takes a cat to write the perfect mystery, Cat on the Scent. Mrs. Murphy loped along fields swallowed in darkness, skirting the creek dividing Harry's land from the Blair Bain Bridge's picturesque farm. She wanted to visit the 911 Turbo. The humans hadn't given her enough time to thoroughly inspect the car. A movement out of the corner of her eye caught some attention. About 50 yards away, a swaying in the bushes along the upper creek. She stopped. In a split second, she whirled around, blasting for home as fast as she could. She heard the quick swish of the spring grasses behind her. Longer strides in hers were gaining on her. With a surge of her own turbo, Mrs. Murphy ran flat out, her belly skimming the earth, her tail horizontal, her whiskers and ears swept back. She charged into the paddock of the west side of the barn where Pop-Tart, Gin Fizz, and Tomahawk were munching. Help me, she streaked past Harry's shoes. The three horses spread out as the 40 pound bobcat tore over the earth. They pawed, snorted, and ran around, forcing the big cat to weave. It gave Mrs. Murphy just enough time to dodge into the barn and climb into the hayloft. She ran to the open hayloft door. Tucker, help me! The horses continued to chase the bobcat, who easily evaded them. The powerful animal slid out of the paddock to, the, to sit outside in front of the hayloft, where she eyed her quarry above. The owl, on a trip back to her nest with a mouse, swooped low over the bobcat, but the animal wasn't afraid. Simon, in the feed room, gobbling up sweet feed that had fallen on the floor, froze stiff. He was all ready to flop over and play dead if necessary. Gin Fizz, old and wise, ordered the others. Make a lot of noise, we've got to wake Harry. Pewter, asleep on the kitchen table, woke up at the din of the neighing and dashed out to the window. Seeing, an instant, seeing in an instant what was going on, she hurried to the bedroom, leaping on Harry with all her weight. Ugh! Harry opened one eye. Tucker, wake up! Pewter shrouded at the do shouted at the dog, sleeping on her side. Bobcat! Huh? The bobcat's sitting under the hayloft and she'll get Murphy. Where's Murphy? In the hayloft, stupid. Tucker shook her head. Why did cats hunt at night? Nonetheless, the corgi scampered to her feet and barreled through the animal door in the kitchen. Wake up, wake up! Pewter jumped up and down on Harry. The neighing and snorting finally filtered into Harry's ears. Damn it. She shot out of bed, switched on a light, and grabbed her shotgun from the closet. She slipped four shells into the pocket of her robe, which was half on, half off, as she ran in her bare feet from, for the kitchen door. Tucker squared off against the bobcat, who was spoiling for a fight. Don't risk it. Mrs. Murphy leaned so far over the hayloft opening she nearly fell out. The bobcat waited until Harry switched on the outside lights. Then she turned, calling over her shoulder. Beware, little cousin. The hunter can become the hunted. With one mighty bound, the bobcat cleared the paddock fence and ran to the northern side. Jin Fizz giving chase. By the time Harry reached the fence line, she saw the bobcat cruising along, maybe 100 yards out. She put down the shotgun to climb over the fence. You guys all right? In the moonlight, she carefully checked the horses for scratches or injuries. Dawn was a half hour away. Then she hurried back to the barn, looking up at her friend. Are you all right? Come down where I can see you. She walked into the barn and clicked on the lights. As Mrs. Murphy was backing down the ladder, Harry ducked her head in the feed room to see if any mice were in evidence. Simon. Simon was playing possum. He'd been so traumatized by the bobcat that when he heard Harry's voice, he couldn't move forward or backwards, so he just drooped over. One eye opened when Harry cut off the light. Mrs. Murphy landed on the tack trunk. Let me look at you. If I have to make a screaming run over into Chris Middleton's at this hour, I won't stay friends with our vet for long. You'd better be okay. I am. Mrs. Murphy's fur was still puffed. Tucker, who'd run around the other side of the barn in case the bobcat pulled a fast one, trotted down the center aisle from the back. Brave dog. 
Harry patted the broad head. I'm a corgi, Tucker shrugged. Thanks, Tucker, I owe you one. Mrs. Murphy jumped down to rub along Tucker's side. The three walked back to the house, Harry stepping lively since her bare feet were cold. Pewter greeted them at the door. I told you not to hunt too far from the barn. You stayed inside, chicken. I'd have come out at five and fought if I had to, she growled. And in truth, Pewter could be a lion when need be. Mrs. Murphy laughed now that the danger was over. Close call. Harry, wide awake, made a pot of coffee as she fed the animals. She'd grown up in the country. She understood the ways of predators. She knew that life could change in the blink of an eye. One false step and you were a bigger animal's breakfast, or even a smaller animal's, if it was smart enough and strong enough. Chapter 14. Oak Ridge rises out of the land south of Lovingston, Virginia. Built in 1802 by a Revolutionary War veteran, one of the Rives family of Albemarle, the estate was buff buffeted from the scalding rises and freezing plunges of unregulated capitalism. The originator of Oak Ridge rode the economy like the tides. His progeny fared less well, and over the 19th century, the place changed hands, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Finally, Thomas Fortune Ryan, a local boy in 1851, made good in the New York stock market and bought that place he remembered from his impoverished childhood. By that time, 1904, Ryan was the third richest man in America. True riches, for there was no internal revenue service. He set about creating a great country estate. Not on the scale of not on the scale of Blenheim, but on a Virginia scale, which meant he kept a sense of proportion. The mansion was 23,000 square feet and 80 other small and 80 other smaller houses, barns, and water towers completed the plan. A hot house, built as a smaller version of London's famed Crystal Palace, sat below the mansion. The place bore the mark of a single, overriding, rapacious mind. An alley of oak trees guided the visitor to the main house from the road, the northern back side of the house. The grander entrance was on the other, southern side facing the railroad tracks because that was how Mr. Ryan rode into his country estate from New York in his sumptuous private car. The buggies, gigs, and occasional coach and Ford drove up the back way. Given that the glory days of rail travel were over, the approach now was from Route 653 the paved highway to Shipman, the Broad Road. The reenactors camped on the miles of front lawn and former golf course. The Sibley tents resembling teepees, common tents, and larger offices tents, dotting the verdant expanse like over large tissues. The reenactors would have to tramp a half mile to the oak tree reckoned to be 380 years old. The Yankees would rise up out of the eastern woods surrounding the Trinity Episcopal Church, while the Southerners would be marching due north from the edge of Mrs. Wright's hayfields. The view was better for the public from the oak tree, and it reduced the possibility of a raid on the main house. Having that many people on her front lawn caused the petite and pretty Rhonda Holland some inconvenience, but she bore it with good grace. John, her dynamic husband, delighted in strolling along the neatly laid out avenues of tents to chat with the fellows cleaning rifles, fiddling, and singing. A convivial, a conv, a convivial man wearing a floppy straw hat, he had plans for Oak Ridge as magnificent as Thomas Fortune Ryan's. John worked more slowly than Ryan, thanks to the... Oh. Thanks to the proliferation of government agencies choking him with regulations, but he never gave up. The entire Holland family was on hand to view the reenactment, as they were thirty thousand, as were thirty thousand other, a far larger crowd than anyone had anticipated. And in the five thousand reenactors, add in the five thousand reenactors, including camp followers, and there was a mess of people. Harry sat on a camp stool. Tucker sat next to her, and Mrs. Murphy and Pewter lounged on a camp table spread with maps. 
The cats weren't supposed to come, but they'd hidden under the seat of the truck, then raced to freedom when the door was opened. Pewter nibbled on a square of hard track. How could they eat this stuff? <laughs> with difficulty, the tiger said, watching Fair Hairstein struggle with his gold sword a sash. Here, Harry wound it around his middle, the two tasseled ends of the sash, tempting Mrs. Murphy, but not enough to leave her perch, just enough for her to swat at the tassels when he walked by. Fair, a twinkle in his eye said, I love it when you fuss over me. Stand still, Harry commanded, but she smiled when she said it. You know, I never looked so good as when you bought my clothes. Fair, stand still. You're a vet. Coveralls aren't that glamorous. You look the same now as when we were married. Met my Sunday clothes. He playfully pinched her buttock. I liked it best when you undressed me. Police, Harry drew out the word, pretending to ignore the banter. She secretly enjoyed it. There, a proper Confederate officer. I'd rather be improper. What is with you? Maybe the prospect of battle is an aphrodisiac, she laughed. No, you're the aphrodisiac. I'm only doing this for Ned Tucker. He kissed her on the cheek. A shout outside the tent sent them onto the grass avenue. Archie Ingram and Sir H. Vane Temptis fought for Sir H.'s tent, next to Fair and Ned's tent. Archie, lean and quicker than the Englishman, cracked him hard on the jaw. The larger man, about 40 pounds overweight, sagged for an instant against the corner tent pole. The tent wobbled dangerously. Then, Vane Temptis collected himself, lunging for Archie, grabbing him by the waist and bullying him out onto the grassy avenue. Sarah, in a pale melon gown complete with hoop skirt, rushed out. Smart enough not to get in between them, she hissed, Stop it! The men paid no mind. Faden Temptis clumsily ducked Archie's blows, but enough landed that the red marks swelled on his cheeks. Archie danced around him. One solid blow off the vein Temptis would have picked the smaller man off his feet, then sent him crashing to the ground. Fair watched for a moment, then grabbed Archie's upraised hand. Archie whirled around and caught Fair on the side of his head. Ned Tucker, running from the other side of the avenue, seized the Englishman before he could land a telling blow on Archie. Although 30 years older than Archie, Sir H wanted to fight. Vane Temptis shook Ned off more easily than Ned thought he could. The two antagonists pounded each other again. Herb Jones, dressed in his artillery sergeant's major, Ar sergeant major's outfit, hurried out of the headquarters tent. Larry Johnson, Hayden McIntyre, and a host of other crozet men fell, followed. The two men from Rap Rappenhannock. The two men from Rappenhannock County dashed over, canteens banging against their hips. The four of them finally separated Vane Temptist, who was sputtering, bloody this and bloody that, from Archie, who grimly said nothing. Sarah rushed to her husband's aid. He needed ice held to his cheek. He grandly pushed her aside with one arm and advanced on Archie once more. Baron Bobby Forrester from Rappenhannock lunged for him again. Leave me alone, the florid pleer of the realm commanded. Herb Jones strode into the middle of everyone. Gentlemen, save it for the Yankees. This made everyone laugh except for Archie and his opponent. Even Vame Temptis evinced a small smile. Tucker, Mrs. Murphy, and Pewter sat quietly at their campsite, watching the exchange. They can't abide each other, Tucker scratched her ear. H. Vane gave Bo Cup money to Archie's campaign last year. Mrs. Murphy swatted at a fly. You'd have thought they were two peas in a pod then. Guess Archie didn't keep his promises. I'll settle with you later, Archie's jaw jutted out, his facial muscles tense. You'll settle with me? That's a laugh. Vane Temptis smoothed his hair with his right hand, and you had no business invading my tent in the first place. Archie, come with me. Herb put his hand under Archie's elbow. Fair, you keep an eye on H. Vane until we draw up in formation. Yes, sir. Fair saluted. The gray line parted as her propelled the county commissioner towards the HQ tent. Men listened to Herb. He'd attended VMI and then fought in Korea, where he'd experienced a... Hmm. Men listened to Herb. 
He'd attended VMI and then fought in Korea where he experienced a revelation about his calling on earth. When he returned home, he entered his seminary, which provoked no end of amusement among his contemporaries. They'd known him as a hellraiser in military school. Now, Arch, what's the matter with you? You're becoming a liability, Archie snapped, his knuckles bleeding. I was going to say an embarrassment. Herb didn't mince words. You're an elected official. We're in Nelson County now, not Albemarle. Archie hung his head, half mumbling. You know this will get into the papers. Archie glumly said nothing as Herb continued to guide him towards the large HQ tent. As the crowd dispersed, Sarah allowed herself a flash of temperament. H, you are a perfect ass. And you're a perfect bitch, he evenly replied. Well, that does it. You can play soldier by yourself. I always thought this was so silly to begin with, grown men dressing up and waving swords about. At least your father was a real soldier. That's below the belt, Sarah. His mouth clamped shut like a vice. But then that's your favorite geography, isn't it? You forgot I served in the RAF, just as I didn't have, I just didn't have a, the good fortune of being born in the time for being war. I just didn't have the good fortune of being born in time for the big war. Fair, face reddening because he didn't want to hear his exchange, stepped away from the sparring couple. You won't run after Arch. No, Vane Tempest turned on his booted heel and disappeared into his tent. Mrs. Murphy and Pewter ran over and peeped under the tent flaps. Sarah, cooling down, walked inside after her husband. Why do you let him get under your skin? Vane Tempest sagged heavily on his big trunk. A man who's been bought out to stay bought. A man who's been bought ought to stay bought. Oh, Henry, she called him by his Christian name. You didn't contribute that much. $5,000 at the county commissioner level seems rather large to me. We aren't talking about the Senate, my dear, and I didn't leave the money in a brown paper bag either. I'm not that crude. He mentioned for her to stop speaking as Ned Tucker entered the tent. Why not? Vane Temptist answered. Oh, think you can go out today? Why not? Vane Temptist answered, the soft-spoken lawyer, Susan's husband. You took, a, you took a couple good pops to the face. Ah, he can't hit that hard. Not exactly true since Archie had rocked him with the blow to the jaw, but his punches were light otherwise. Can you put this aside? I mean, you two are marching in the same company. Vane Temptist shrugged, the shrug of superiority. He won't bother me. I apologize for losing my temper in the first place. I don't like his attentions to my wife. Henry, he laughed. He does look at you all the time. That's not why you were fighting. Leave me out of this. It's none of my business. Ned took a step back to leave, but please keep a lid on it out there. The two kitties ducked their heads, scampering back to Fair and Harry. What'd you make of that? Mrs. Murphy felt something was unexpressed, something beyond anger unevolved. Pewter scooted in under the tent bottom, nearly emerging between Harry's feet. Humans are unevolved. Where have you two been? Harry pointed a finger. Eavesdropping. I'm taking you to the truck. I'll leave the windows cracked, but you aren't going to get into that crowd. I can't believe you snuck under the seat of the truck to begin with, little devils. The fast and without that fast and without consulting each other, the cats tore out of there. Mrs. Murphy, pewter. Harry ran after them, and Fair started after her, but the bugle called him to formation. Should we stay just in view or dumper? Pewter asked. Let's just stay in sight and run her to exhaustion. Mrs. Murphy laughed, turning to see Harry, mad as a wet hen, tearing after them. Tucker right at the human's heels. Chapter 15. Sarah Vane Temptis rustled with each step, her long pastel skirt swaying. H. Vane and company had departed to join their regiment, already marching toward the old racetrack out on the west side of the oak tree. From there, they would wheel out of sight, marching southeast until they landed flattened out. They'd be at the edge of the beautiful hayfields. Her parasol provided some relief from the warming sun. She twirled it with irritation. 
Mrs. Murphy and Pewter raced by her. She barely noticed them, but she did notice Blair Bainbridge, long legs eating up territory as she hurried to fall in as he hurried to fall in with his regiment. He waved as he dashed by. Harry, pan panting, slowed down by Sarah. The cat slowed too, walking the rest of the way but keeping well ahead of Harry. Miranda Hogg and Dauber joined Harry and Sarah. She'd been in the hunter barn, which was on the way to the oak tree from the main house. She bought Fair some hot cakes, a recipe from her grandmother who remembered the time of Virginia's sorrows. Since Mrs. Hogg and Dauber's great-grandfather had ridden with the cavalry, she gravitated toward the barn. The more I think about those two, the madder I get. Sarah's parasol whirled savagely. Making me dizzy, Mrs. Hogg and Bogger remarked. She met with the twirling parasol. What I should have done is crown them with it. Sarah stopped twirling. They're like two little boys fighting over a fire truck. Exactly which fire truck? Harry got to the point. The zoning variance. Sarah closed her parasol. H. Vane is still livid over Archie squashing his request for a variance to open the quarry. His revenge is to push for the reservoir. But Archie appears to support the reservoir, although, God knows, he has obstructed everything. I told Fair after the commission meeting that Archie is saying one thing about doing another. Who knows what he's really going to do about the reservoir when the chips are down. Harry hated politics, especially in her own backyard. Appears is the operative word. Behind the scenes, he's doing everything he can do to retard progress. My husband knows all of this, of course. <sighs> she sighed. Henry adores political intrigue. So what side is Sir H on? Harry bluntly asked. His own, Sarah laughed. Spirits a bit restored. Well, Miranda fanned herself with the program advertising whalebone corsets and a hoop skirt, as well as bayonets and ha haversacks. I hope they mend their fences. Ego. Neither one of them will make a peace office offering. Sarah tapped her foot with the closed parasol. <sighs> How did women wear these things? She pushed her crinolines. Hmm. She pushed her crinolines forward, and the entire bell of the skirt flowed with them. The heat does not help. A warm front had moved in, and the weather was sticky. If you were dropped off of a plane, you'd be safe, Tucker snickered. Sarah glanced down at the dog, a frown on her pretty mouth. It was as if she knew what the corgi was saying to her. Damn, I forgot H's extra canteen. He will be furious. What's in the canteen? Glenlivet, she raised an eyebrow. He's cheating. I really do think this authenticity thing has gone too far. Do you know they even have rules about how to die? You are kidding. Harry laughed. If you're shot, you have to fall down with your head to the side so that you can breathe with your, firearm, with your firearm in your hand a bit away from your body. There are no other rules, but that's the only one I remember. Oh, there are other rules, but that's the only one I remember. And they decide who will be injured, who will die, and who will survive. And if it's a general reenactment, if it's a true battle reenactment like Sharpsburg, the men take on their identities of real soldiers. They have to fall in the exact spots where the soldiers were hit. Strange, Miranda muttered. Rules for dying? Harry stooped over to pick up Pewter, who had slowed. The obsession with violence. The obsession with that war especially. No good ever came of it. Miranda shook her head. Harry disagreed with her. The slaves were freed? Yes, Miranda said. Free to starve. The Yankees were hypocrites. Still are. Sarah, raised in Connecticut, smiled tightly. I'm going back to get my lord and master's canteen. I'll see you at the battle. She turned and as and ran as fast as Ooh. She turned and ran as fast as pantaloons, a hoop skirt, and a yard of, a of material would allow. Her bonnet, tied under her neck, flapped behind her. Harry and Miranda reached the beautiful oak tree. Fair had given them tickets for seats on a small reviewing stand. They took their places. Follow me, Mrs. Murphy joyfully commanded as she scampered to the base of the tree, sank her razor-sharp claws in the yielding bark, and climbed high. Pewter, a good climber, was on her tail. 
Tucker, irritated, watched the two giggling felines. She couldn't see anything because everywhere she turned there were humans. Harry shaded her eyes, glancing up at the cats who sat on a high, wide branch, their tails swishing to and fro in excitement. She nudged Miranda. Best seats in the house, Miranda laughed. Tucker returned to Harry, sitting in front of her. I can't see a thing, the peeved dog complained. Hush, honey. Harry patted Tucker's silky head. A low drum roll hushed everyone. A line of Union cannons ran parallel to Route 653. The Confederate cannons, 14-pounders, sat at a right angle to the Union artillery. The backs of the artillerymen were visible to the crowd as both sides began firing. A wealth of smoke belched from the mouths of the guns. In the far distance, Harry heard another drum. Goosebumps covered her arms. Miranda, too, became silent. Do you think if Jefferson Davis had challenged Abe Lincoln to hand-to-hand -hand combat, they could have avoided this? Pewter wondered. No. Pewter didn't pursue her line of questioning. She was too focused on all she could see from her high perch. The tight squares of opposing regiments fast stepped into place. On the left, the officer in charge of his square raised his saber. Ahead of the squares, both sides of the both sides sent out scrimmages. For this particular reenactment, the organizers had choreographed hand-to-hand -hand combat among the scrimmagers. As they grappled, fought, and threw one another on the ground, the cannons fired now with more precision, the harmless shot soaring high over everyone's heads. Harry coughed. Stuff scratches. Miranda, hanky to her nose, nodded. As the drumbeats grew louder, the crowd strained forward. They could hear officers calling out orders. The Union regiment at the forefront stopped at the Confederates, still at a distance, and moved forward. Load, called out the captain. The soldiers placed their muskets, barrels out, between their feet. As the officer called out further loading, loading orders, they poured gunpowder down the barrels and rammed the charges home. Ha! Pewter was watching Fair, struggling with his frightened horse. Mrs. Murphy, knowing Fair was a fine rider, didn't find it quite as funny as Pewter did. I don't think anyone knows how to get the horses used to this noise and the sulfur smell. Fair's big bay shield, dancing sideways. At the next volley of cannon fire, the horse reared up, came down on his two forelegs and bucked straight out with his hind legs. A jolting, snapping hell of a buck. Fair sat the first one, but the succeeding ones spiced up with a side-to-side -side twisting action, sent him under the sweet grass with a thud. The horse, no fool, spun around, flying back toward the hunter's stables. Fair, disgusted, picked himself up, then looked around, realized he was in a battle, and then ran over to join his unit. Sir H. Vane Tempest, on the front corner of the 1st Regiment, grimly stared into the billowing smoke. Archie Ingram was farther back in the square, as was Blair Bainbridge. Ridley Kent marched in the second unit behind them. Mrs. Murphy strained to see through the smoke, which would clear, then close up again with new fire. Reverend Herb Jones, red sash wrapped around his tunic, sat on an up upturned wagon to the rear of the table. The heat had exhausted him. Dr. Larry Johnson and Ned Tucker were in the third line of the regiment, faces flushed. Everywhere the two cats looked, they saw familiar faces in unfamiliar clothes. The smoke thinning over the men's faces like a soft silver veil made them look even more eerie. The first volley of the rifle fire from the Yankees rolled over the turf with a crackle. Small slits of flame leapt from muzzles. Mrs. Murphy hoped they would be smart enough to keep their heads away from the barreled nozzles when ramming home the next charge. A man could lose fingers or part of a hand that way if a, sm a spark smoldered deep down in the gun. By now, all but one of the mounted officers had, brought some, had bought some real estate. The only animal moving forward was a huge Belgian draft horse, the horse calm as if on a parade. A few corpses dotted the field. Then a shroud of smoke enveloped the field as all the guns fired at once. Pop, pop, pop. Rifles and handguns reported between the rhythmic firing of the electric cannons. Poor suckers died blind. Mrs. Murphy's whiskers twitched. Ugh, Pewter shuddered. Only a human would die for an idea. That's the truth. 
The tiger blinked when a bit of smoke floated over the branches. You know, they can't accept reality. Reality is that everything is happening at once and to everybody. There's no special sense to it. So humans invent systems. If one human system collides with another human system, they fight. The only reality is nature. Pewter, not a philosophical cat like Mrs. Murphy, was nonetheless a smart one. True enough, as the smoke cleared, she saw her H. Vain, she saw Sir H. Vane Temptis break from the ranks, never to be outdone, and sprint toward the enemy. A loud crack, another volley of cannon fire, and he went down, a hero to the cause. The battle grew more intense. Tucker, since she couldn't see, lay on the reviewing stand between Harry's feet. She hated the noise, and the sulfur fumes offended her delicate nose. After 15 more minutes of the hardest fought section of the reenactment, the Yankees broke and ran. That, too, was choreographed. It would never do for the Union troops to wallop Southerners on South Turf unless it was a precise reenactment of an actual battle won by the Yankees. Not only was this a sop to Southern vanity, but it was also a pretty accurate sense. The North hadn't begun to routinely chalk up victories until the latter part of the war, when victories in the West ensured victories in the East, and tens of thousands died. The drummers kept drumming as, they, as the last smoke wafted over the flat expanse of the hayfield, formerly an old airfield. The routed Yankees ran toward Route 653, collected themselves, and turned left, heading for the racetrack. The wounded, in the name of authenticity, were being carried off on stretchers. A few of the dead had gel packs, which squashed when they fell. The fake blood gave them a realistic appearance. As the last of the wounded were carried to the hospital tent, the dead began to stir. The cats sat in the tree and laughed. Tucker watched with curiosity. She'd moved to the front of the reviewing stand. One corpse didn't move. A confederate, resurrected, walked by without paying attention. Archie Ingram, formerly deceased, also walked by. He stopped, nudging the body with his boot. Nothing happened. Many people in the crowd were walking back to the main house, unaware of the unfolding drama. The fast two cats backed down the tree, streaking across the field. Tucker, Mrs. Murphy hollered. The dog left Harry, just now noticing the curious sight, to join the cats. Archie, down on his hands and knees, turned over the body. It was Sir H. Vane Tempest. Mrs. Murphy reached Vane Tempest before Pewter or Tucker. As the breathless gray cat caught up, the tiger sniffed the body. Powder was all she said. The corgi, famous for her scenting abilities, gawked for an instant. He looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. Wow. Now on chapter 16. People slowly began to return to the field. At the first sight of Archie kneeling over Vane Temptis looked like acting. Hmm. People slowly began to return to the field. At first, the sight of Archie kneeling over Vane Temptis looked like acting. Distraught, he loosened the older man's collar. Harry, a sprinter, had been the first person out from the sidelines. She grasped Vane Temptis' wrist to take his pulse. Irregular, his breathing was shallow. Miranda, slower but hurrying, motioned for Dr. Larry Johnson to join her. The gray-haired Confederate dumped his weapon and ran. Reverend Jones solicited a four-wheel drive to take him to the victim. Bane Tempest, in shock, stared upward with glassy eyes. His lips moved. Larry tore open his tunic. The bullet holes, neat, could have been drawn on his chest except that blood oozed out of them. Susan Tucker jumped into a farm truck parked on the side of the view of the battle. She pressed on the horn, making her way through the crowd, looking for Sarah. Sarah, returning with her husband's canteen, was slowed by the distance. The heat, and now the retreating crowd. Susan caught sight of her at the hunter barn, standing at the open door, shielding her eyes against the sun. Finally reaching Sarah, she shouted, Get in! Oh God, he's really mad at me, isn't he? I'd had to catch my breath for a minute. It's sweltering in this dress. 
Susan didn't answer Sarah. She was trying to return to the battlefield as fast as she could, given the crowd, which slowly got out of her way as she laid on the horn. She pulled up close to where Larry was working on Vane Tempest. Sarah at first didn't realize it was her husband lying on the ground, the focus of grim activity. Susan nudged her out of the farm truck. Sarah stood by the truck and door and for a second, Sarah stood by the truck door for a second, then ran out for the prostrate, prostrate, I got it. Sarah stood by the truck for a second, then ran out for the prostrate figure. She tore away her hoop skirt to run faster. Harry, keep people away, Larry ordered, then barked at Miranda, see to Sarah. Sarah, mute, fought Miranda. Boom Boom ran up to help the older woman. Together, they pulled Sarah a short distance from her husband so Larry could work unmolested. Hold his head still. You might have to clear his mouth out. Larry spoke low and calmly. Harry, on her knees, placed a hand on either side of Van Tempest's florid face as Larry crossed one hand over the other and pumped on the wounded man's chest with all his weight. The two cats watched, as did Tucker. She put her nose to the ground, but knew it was hopeless. Too many feet to, had trod the earth. Too many guns had been fired. Shot in the back for sure, Mrs. Murphy softly said. What a terrible accident. Tucker hung her head. Not an accident, Mrs. Murphy crisply remarked. Three bullets in the back is no accident. Pewter stared at the trigger. Archie knelt on the other side of the gasping man. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Vane Tempest blinked. His eyes cleared for a moment and he seemed to recognize everyone, but his left lung was filling with blood. In the distance, an ambulance squealed. Harry watched Larry work. She'd known him all her life as a family doctor, but this was the first time she'd seen him dealing with an emergency. She admired his cool for proficiency and in his physical and his physical strength. In his middle 70s, Larry acted like a man in his 50s. The ambulance rolled out onto the field. Within seconds, the crew, headed by a Diana Robb, had Vane Tempest on a stretcher and inside the vehicle. Larry hopped in behind and the doctor slammed. Waynesboro, Diana called to Harry and Miranda. It's the closest hospital. Miranda and Boom Boom guided Sarah to the back of the farm truck. They squeezed in, heading to Waynesboro, a good 25 miles away and up over a treacherous Afton Gap. As the humans continued to mill around in disbelief, Mrs. Murphy suggested, fan five feet apart and move toward the tree. What are we looking for? Tucker inquired. Spent bullets. The holes in his chest were made by clean exits. Archie, shaking, walked toward the main house, a vacant look on his face. Harry caught up to him. She called over her shoulder. Come on, kids. In a minute, Tucker barked. Hurry, it won't take long for one of these fools to go grind the bullets into the earth, the tiger urged. Found one, Peter stopped. The other two ran over. Sure enough, it was a lead bullet, faddish, with three concentric rings on the bottom and a squashed nose lying in the grass. Can't call her back, the tiger thought out loud. Tucker, carry it in your mouth. The corgi happily pinched the bullet between her teeth. Don't swallow, Peter teased. They trotted after Harry, who eased Archie toward the hunter barn. I need to get back to my tent. Arch, there will be questions. You're better off here. I didn't shoot him. Archie was beginning to comprehend the full impact of this dolorous event. Of course you didn't. However, why subject yourself to strangers or even friends asking questions you may not be emotionally prepared to answer? Come on in here. I'll find Cynthia Cooper. I know she's around. This is Sheriff Hill's territory, Archie vaguely protested. I know that, but it can't hurt to have an Albor Marley deputy with you. Archie, trust me. His emotions crystallized into anger. Trust you? For Christ's sakes, you're the goddamn postmistress. You don't know what you're doing. He pushed by, plunging into the crowd. Harry said nothing. She walked into the barn. Fair was brushing, his, brushing down his horse. He looked up. Hi. H. Vane's been shot. What? Fair stopped. Brush held midair. Shot through the back. Really shot? It was sinking in. Really shot. Some fool back there actually firing bullets? Of all the stupid...
maybe it wasn't stupid. Don't let your imagination run away with you. Who would shoot H. Fain on purpose? He's not worth the lead. That popped out of his mouth before he realized it. A lot of men marched behind him, including Archie and Grim. Ingram. You know how people think. It's absurd, he paused. Is he gonna make it? Is he going to make it? I don't know. Larry Johnson worked on him. He's on his way to Waynesboro Hospital. Well, they've dealt with gunshot wounds before. Tucker walked up to Harry and opened her mouth, dropping the bullet smack onto Harry's foot. Good job. Pewter praised the dog. Mrs. Murphy studied her, studied her human's face. Harry bent over to pick up the fired bullet. Good Lord, she said, then stared at Tucker, who smiled back. All right. A lot of activity happening here. We're going to start on chapter 17. Miranda's house, centrally located behind the post office, provided a gathering place for old friends. Her cooking drew them in as well. Few things delighted Miranda Hog Hogendauber as much as feeding those she loved and even those she didn't love. Holy Scripture bade her to love all mankind. Holy Scripture bade her to love all mankind, but many times she found the theory easier than the practice. Harry helped serve apple cider and Tom Collins's. Boom Boom had remained at the hospital, but then Boom Boom flourished amid tragedy, especially if the tragedy was visited upon someone other than herself. However, since she and Sarah were friends, her staying on might serve some good purpose. Cynthia Cooper sat next to Fair. They were both such light blondes that they could have been twins, although they were not related or even distantly, which is always a disappointment to a true Virginian. I can understand someone taking a shot at Archie, but not Sir H. Vane Tempest. Cynthia sipped the most delicious apple cider she had ever tasted. In conjunction with Miranda's piping hot scones, it was perfection. You don't know that it was on purpose. Harry passed around the silver tray filled with jellies, preserves, and unsalted butter. She thought the shots were intentional, but she wanted to see what others would say. Actually, I should be the one to say that. Cynthia dumped mounds of persimmon jelly on her scone. You're off duty, Harry smiled at her. Tell me again about the bullet. Cynthia split open the scone, releasing a thin waft of moist, fragrant air. Tucker dropped it at my feet and I gave it to Sheriff Hill. The dog, greedily gobbling the raw hamburger mixed with raw egg that Miranda had made for her, didn't even glance up when her name was spoken, nor did Mrs. Murphy or Pewter, faces deep in cooked, diced chicken. I wonder why she picked it up, Miranda thought out loud. Maybe it had blood on it, Harry replied, then noticed that everyone stopped eating for a moment. Sorry. A light rap on the back door followed by a yoo-hoo diverted them to the, from the unpleasant thought. Come in, Miranda called from the kitchen. Herb Jones eased through the door. A blade cooling of cooling night air followed him. Any word? Nope. He sat down. Harry offered the minister his choice of beverage. He requested coffee since Miranda always had a pot on the stove. Miranda bustled in with a tray of fresh scones. She set them on the tea trolley. Sit down, Miranda. You work too hard, Herb told her. I will in a minute. She walked back to the kitchen, returning in moments with a cup of hot coffee. People are already saying that Archie shot him. Herb dabbed his lips with a cocktail napkin. That's all they're talking about. Even Mim, who's usually circumspect, says it bears all the marks of Archie's scheming. Scheming? In front of everyone? Harry said. The taciturn fair spoke up. That's her point. No one will ever be able to prove that Archie fired at H. People can talk all they want. They can't prove it. Archie's devious by nature. Fair, I'm surprised to hear you say that. Miranda's voice shot upward. He's played both ends against the middle all his life. That doesn't mean he's bad, just devious. Can't they test weapons? Miranda directed the question to Cynthia. Yes, she swallowed, then continued. And I'm sure Sheriff Hill will do just that. 
but everyone was loading and firing so all the barrels will be filled with powder and no one was supposed to have real bullets. This could prove very interesting. You know, H. Vane has spent a lifetime abusing his body. I wonder if he can pull through this. Harry watched Mrs. Murphy and Pewter change dishes. Why do they each think the other one's got something better? We don't, Mrs. Murphy brushed a bit of chicken off her chin. It's our food dance, said Pewter, nose in the bowl. It is not, Tucker giggled. It is too, Murphy called to the tailless dog. I can smell what she has in her dish and she can smell what I have in mine. We like to do it, that's all. You stick your face in your food and inhale it. We cats have more delicacy of manner and more taste buds, Pewter said. You do not. Yes, we do. We even have better taste buds than they do. Pewter indicated the humans. <laughs> well, that's not saying much. The dog sat down. She was too full to stand. You are all getting awfully chatty over there, Harry reprimanded her pets as the decibel level of their conversation increased. Three pairs of eyes glared at, the, at her, but the animals did pipe down. Where's Susan? Herb asked. I don't know, but before Archie left the campground, he asked Ned to represent him. Harry, why didn't you say something? Cynthia was surprised. It doesn't mean he did it. The only reason I know is I passed Susan on my way out of the hunter barn. She paused. I can't stand Archie Ingram. I really don't give a damn what happens to him and I might even lower myself to enjoy his discomfort. Everyone stared at her, including the animals. Harry, your mother didn't raise you to be like that, Miranda chided her. No, but my mother didn't have to deal with Archie after he became a county commissioner either. He got the big head. Anyway, I can't always be a proper Virginia lady. I'm too young to be that proper. A raffish grin crossed her face. Lifeline, Cynthia half smiled. I'd sooner bleed from the throat. How do you stand it? Since no one there had realized that Cynthia attended the self-help group, they smiled nervously, waiting for her rejoin rejoinder. Cynthia smiled reflectively. I've seen people bleed from the throat. I'm sorry, Harry apologized, genuinely upset with herself. Does it work? Fair innocently asked. I've only been once, but I think it will teach me techniques to handle situations better. It's not really therapy or anything, more of a learning session. Miranda was dying to ask more questions, but decided she'd do it in private. The phone rang. Hello, Miranda didn't cover the microphone. Mim, she listened. He's what? She listened some more. Thanks. Miranda hung up the phone and ran over to the television. She clicked on Channel 29's news. An interview with Archie Ingram was in progress. Archie, dressed in a three-piece suit and a turquoise tie, was answering a reporter's questions. He stood outside of the county offices. Unfortunate incidents. I realize many will point a finger at me because of my recent strained relationship with Sir H. Vane Tempest, but our friendship is deeper than, his recent dis than this recent disagreement. What is the nature of this disagreement, Mr. Ingram? We have different visions on how best to serve Albemarle's County. Political differences. The reporter interrupted before Archie could cite his record. It's about water, isn't it? I'm sick of talking about the damn reservoir. Archie's face purpled. <clears throat> yes, we disagree, but I wouldn't shoot him over it. But at the meeting at Crozette High School last week, the hell with you, lady, Archie walked off the camera. The cameraman swung around and followed him. Archie loomed into the lens of the camera and the camera bobbled. The sound of it hitting the sidewalk could be heard. Then the picture went black for a second. The image switched back to the studio. Is he stone stupid or what? Harry blurted out. You know, the funny thing is, it would make sense if someone had shot Archie. Doesn't make sense that H got it. Herb shook his head. Maybe Archie was, a, was the target and H Vane got in the way. Harry said, there's a, there's a lot of H Vane and not much of Archie. Archie's protesting too much. Mrs. Murphy announced to no one in particular and everyone in general, he's covering something up. Yeah, he's covering up that he shot H. Vane in broad daylight before 30,000 people. Tucker stood up again, felt the effort too great, and then sat back down. Something else, the tiger blinked, swayed in that way that cats do, a light forward and backward motion. All right.
And that's the end of chapter 17. And we're going to do two more chapters and end on 20. Chapter 18. Sarah Vane Tempest slept at the hospital for two nights. When her husband was moved out of the intensive care and onto the critical list, she allowed Miranda to take her home. Exhausted, raccoon-eyed, Sarah invited Miranda in for tea. Honey, I brought up some quiche. I'll warm it for you while you take a shower. By the time you're finished, the food will be ready. If the hospital calls, come get me even if I'm in the shower. I will and don't worry, you've worried enough for, the th for three women, Miranda smiled. Anyway, Blair Bainbridge is taking a turn with your husband. I had no idea they'd gotten that close. Outsiders. They both feel like outsiders since their families aren't from Virginia. Oh well, it is like the Cotswolds, so H mostly loves it here. Vane Tempest had been born in a particularly lovely part of England. Go on now, Miranda pushed her in the direction of her bedroom. She warmed the oven unwrap and unwrapped her homemade breads the dishcloth slightly damp to prevent them from drying out. She hummed a hymn as she set the table. Miranda held that the way a woman organizes her kitchen tells you everything you need to know about her, that and her shoes. Sarah, mm, excuse me. Sarah's kitchen, the latest in high-tech gadgetry, boasted an enormous brass espresso maker from Italy. It rested on the mar marble countertop. Velvet lined drawers contained Tiffany silver for everyday use. The evening silver was locked in the pantry. Miranda couldn't imagine using Tiffany silver for breakfast and lunch. The refrigerator, dishwasher, microwave, and double oven had black shiny surfaces. At the top of the wall, six inches from the ceiling, a green neon line acted as molding. It was all very playfully and hideously expensive, but at least it was extremely well organized. While the quiche warmed, Miranda opened the closet. Two Confederate uniforms hung there, each of them clean. Both sported the blue facings of the infantry. Sarah walked back into the kitchen, her slippers scuffling. Miranda turned around. Two uniforms? Oh, you know how H gets when he suffers these deliriums. Mmm, Miranda did know. Like many wealthy people, H. Vane Tempest rarely glided into an activity. He jumped in with both feet. Spent two, spent oo scoobs of money for equipment, only to abandon the passion a year or two later. Since he had nothing to work for anymore, he needed constant new challenges to occupy his mind. He had bought every possible book, every possible book on the war between the states, going so far as to pester the government of England to let him see any correspondence Queen Victoria might have penned on the matter. Sarah sat down, eyes half closed, as the moist aroma of fresh bread curled into her nostrils. <laughs> Rye and cornbread, Miranda opened the oven, removing the warm breads. Hot pads at the ready, she pulled out the quiche. They ate in silence. Sarah haggard from the crisis. Anyone, knew who, who, anyone who knew Miranda, Hog and Dauber, longed longer than a half hour would figure out that the good woman made a lot of room for both your personality and your situation. Herb says port is fortifying. Might it pick you up? Put me down. I'm so worn out, I don't trust my system. Sarah replied, do you think she'll be all right? Do you think he'll be all right, Miranda? I don't know. He's in God's hands. Well, God's hands are pretty full. Miranda smiled. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as though for something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far and share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. She drew a breath. First Peter, I forget the chapter. How do you remember all that? Miranda shrugged. Just do. When I was a little girl, my sister and I would have memorizing contests. You've never met my sister, have you? Sarah shook her head. Lives in Grenville, South Carolina. Loves it. She cut another piece of quiche for Sarah. I'm full. It's just a nibble. You need your strength. Sarah poked at the bacon and cheese quiche. You draw such comfort from the Bible. Were you raised in the church? Yes, Episcopalian. Very high church. I see. Miranda skipped, sp sipped sparkling water. You might enjoy a more mm, personal church. 
perhaps, came by the noncommittal reply. Miranda marveled at how beautiful Sarah was. Even exhausted, impeccably groomed, her hair the perfect shade of blonde, her eyes startlingly blue, strong chin, full and sensuous lips. Miranda noted these visual enticements. She herself felt no pull toward female beauty. It was rather like watching a sleek cat. She felt men paid dearly for such wives. A cup of coffee? No. I've imbibed enough caffeine in the last two days to qualify me for a Valium prescription. <laughs> well then, I'll just clean up and be on my way. Would you like to call someone to stay with you tonight? I'd hate for you to wake up and be frightened. Boom Boom will come over. After one of her interminable lifeline meetings, I don't know why, she keeps meeting the same men over and over again. Yes, Miranda wanted to say that was probably the point. Will you be all right until then? Of course I will. You were a dear to tend to me. I wasn't tending to you. I was enjoying your company. Chapter 19. Biter leg, Mrs. Murphy ordered Tucker. I will not. That will get me in trouble. You get away with everything. Ah, no, I don't. You bite her then. Cat scratch. Dogs bite. Bull. Pewter piped up. Nothing's going to work. Forget it. They looked out the truck window forlornly as Harry passed Rose Hill, Tally's place. Bite her. We'll go off the road. Tucker bared her fangs at Mrs. Murphy. My, what big teeth you have, Grandma. Mrs. Murphy burst out laughing, joined by Pewter. I hate you. Tucker laid her ears against her pretty face. What's going on here? Harry, eyes on the road, grumbled. If you all can't behave, I'm not taking you out again. She told me to bite you, Tucker indicated Mrs. Murphy by in inclining her head. A lightning fast paw struck the dog on the nose. A bead of blood appeared. Oh, the little dog cried. Damn it, Murphy. Harry pulled off the road and onto the old farm service road of Rose Hill. She stopped, checked the dog, opened the glove compartment for a tissue and held it to the long nose. You play too rough. Tough, the tiger thought, the rhyme funny. Pewter had to laugh too. Bunch of mean cats, Tucker whined. Play it for all it's worth, bubble butt. Mrs. Murphy stepped on Tucker's back, then stepped on Harry's lap. The driver's side window, halfway open, was her goal. She soared through it and off of Harry's lap. Mrs. Murphy, Harry shouted. The cat out sat outside by the driver's door, her lustrous green eyes cast up at her mother's livid visage. I've got something to show you. Good idea. Peter stepped on the dog, then on Harry's lap and then she too jumped out of the truck, although not as gracefully as Mrs. Murphy. You don't know where I'm going. Yes, I do, Pewter looped down on the grassy lane. Don't go without me. Oh, don't you, do don't you dare go without me, the dog howled. Jesus, Harry opened the door, struggling out with the dog in her arms. The corgi was heavy. Before Harry's feet hit the ground, Tucker wriggled, wriggled free, landed and rolled. She hopped to her feet, shook her head, and tore after the cats. Tucker, you come back here, Harry called. I don't believe them. She ran after them. Little good that she did, all as all three barreled on, out of reach, but clearly in sight. The cats didn't deviate or dash off the lane as usual. Harry watched, cursed, then hopped into her truck and followed them at 15 miles an hour. In 10 minutes, Tally's stone cottages and the huge stone hay barn came into view. Harry pulled into the middle of the buildings, cut the motor, and got out just as the cats pushed open the barn door and a crack and flattened themselves to, this, to get inside. She beheld two paws, one tiger, one gray, sticking through the slight gap in the door. It was as though they were waving at her to follow. Tucker put her nose in the door and pushed. She too squeezed inside. They're trying to drive me crazy, Harry said out loud. Really, this is an orchestrated plan to send me round the bend. She walked to the door, rolled it back with a heave, and blinked. Holy shit! You got that right, Mrs. Murphy Cat called. 
All right, that was the end of chapter 19, Rita Mae Brown and Sneaky Pie Brown, Cat on the Scent. And we are gonna pick up on chapter 20 next time. Thank you very much. I'm Nalani Brown, the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones. I hope you enjoyed my reading.